1958 and a Piper J5, and he's a graduate of Western Michigan University and its flight training program. He's accumulated some 9,000 hours of flight time and owns the Cessna 172, from which the Michigan Lighthouse photographs that you'll see today were taken. Um, his knowledge of photography comes through self-study and hands-on experience, and later in college courses. He expanded his area of expertise to underwater photography while working as a diver um, with a division of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. All right, maybe if I move over here. <laughs> okay. Um, he obtained a seaplane rating in Juneau, Alaska in 1958. Aerial photography has been, uh, been a natural adjunct to his aviation career, which involved aircraft sales, Art 135 air taxi, and corporate flying. So, here to tell us about the Michigan Lighthouse series that he began in 1985, please help me welcome John Wagner. <clears throat> Gracious, what, a, what an introduction. She took that from my bio, and my mother wrote my bio. <laughs> I hear something like this, and I think I should quit while I'm ahead. I, um, I haven't done one of these presentations in a few months, so I have a little cheat sheet that I brought along with me to kind of remind me of things. And um, I think this is supposed to be maybe a 40 or 45 minute uh, dissertation. Uh, but this project took me over a period of six and a half years, and I can probably talk an hour on each year. So being a very egalitarian chap, I will go until 51% of you have dozed off. <laughs> Often the question is, that how did I get started in some of this? And uh, it really sort of started as a teenager, I guess. My father was an officer with the Michigan State Police and always had guns and cameras all around, and I had access to all of it. Uh, the Lighthouse Project, I shouldn't tell you too much about it because I describe it in the first chapter of my book. If I refer to my book often, that's a very specific reason why, because it is for sale. <laughs> my book. Yes. Um, actually, I'll give you a brief of it. I, I visited an old fraternity brother that has a house down, about the eight of them, from the Holland Harbor Lighthouse. And his wife, Jan, had taken a number of pictures and I was flying doing other aerial photography, and she asked me to sort of evaluate the pictures that she had from the ground. And uh, on the way out, I thought, geez, maybe that's a clever idea, and I took some pictures of Holland and maybe a few more up and down the shoreline. And one thing sort of uh, led to another, and I accumulated then, I thought, well, this is a reasonable project. I accumulated several uh, photographs of the onshore lighthouses and uh, then was able to exhibit these in various locations of which one of the paramount was the old Kent Bank building in Grand Rapids, which, by the way, financed my book, both printings, for a quarter of a million dollars. So um, I used to like to kind of sneak in around these exhibits and listen to what people had to say, you know, critiquing things. And one comment that was often made was that, She'd say, well, I like this picture, and he'd say, well, I like this picture, and um, then I'd hear the comment, what he needs is a book. Well, I began to run through my mind a little bit, and on one occasion, I was talking to my friend Lou Schillinger, who heads up the Port Austin Reef Lighthouse Group up in Port Austin, and I mentioned that, that you know, maybe taking some of my pictures and doing a book. He said, John, if you're going to do a book, do all the lighthouses in Michigan. That kind of rang a bell. So that's what led into the book project. Um, I guess the next thing to do is that uh, talk a little bit about uh, the airplane that I fly. And it's not very visible. My sidekick over here, Diane, could you maybe switch um, the airplane picture with one of the other ones up above? And um, are there any who, who are here in the room are pilots? Do we have any pilots in the room? <laughs> I, I guess I'd get away with anything then, can I? <laughs> uh, is anybody here from the FAA? <laughs> That's even better yet. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about... Um, I, I, well, I, I, thought, I started flying. Often I ask who in this room is younger than 60 years. 
But after surveying the audience, I don't think I should ask that. So <laughs> I started flying February the 3rd, 1958. So uh, as of this next February, it would be 60 years that I have been flying. And as Stephanie mentioned, I've got some 9,000 hours of flying. And I, I've sold airplanes for eight years. And I flew um, uh, charter, both freight and people, for a couple of years. And then part-time flew a number of uh, corporations, uh, contract usually, Eisenhower Construction, Forsberg Underground Contracting, and um, uh, Maurer Foster Insurance, and Kenny Corporation, and so forth. One of the ones I guess is worth mentioning, too, is Gilbert Associates out of Jackson. Mm -hmm. Gilberts were um, consulting engineers in the nuclear uh, generating business. And I flew into Three Mile Island the day after that popped out there. So um, I'm still here. <laughs> um, the airplane up above here, we'll talk a little bit. It's a Cessna 172. And uh, that's me uh, 20 years ago. Like Hollywood, I want to keep that picture for a long time. And uh, since there are no pilots in the crowd, I'll tell you a few things about the airplane. Uh, the Cessna 172 came originally with a 150-horse engine, and I've later modified that. I can tell you a long story about that, but that would go into it tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> it has now a 180-horse engine and uh, 52 gallons of fuel, which gives it five and a half hours of range. That's a nice little plus for it. And um, it has, uh, as I sometimes say, everything that was ever produced for a Cessna 172 I have on this airplane. Extended baggage, uh, firewall mounted oil filter, an engine uh, pre oiler which pressurizes the oil system, several other things. But also, it has what's known as a Horton Stoll kit, and that's up here on the leading edge of this wing. And the word Stoll is an acronym for short takeoff and landing, which gives me better controllability at slow speeds. I'm able to get this airplane back to maybe 55 miles an hour when I'm photographing and so forth. And it also gives it a better load characteristics. It's modification to the leading edge of the wing. And you can see this little thing right here, which matches up the old wing with the new one. It's got a fence up on the top. It's got conical cambered tips out on the edge, which give it better controllability. And um, here I'm standing uh, with the book. Excuse the reference to the book. <laughs> and the cameras, which we'll talk about uh, just a little bit later. Uh, what else can I say about the airplane? Travels 135 miles an hour, um, high wing. Um, I guess that's kind of, let me, I, I've got a little cheat sheet here that I, um, that I sometimes use. It's been a while. It, this airplane, the first one that I had when I took all the pictures for the book, um, was an earlier airplane. This airplane happens to have an autopilot, which is kind of handy. Uh, because when I'm changing film, and we'll talk about that just a little bit later on. Um, <clears throat> the one other thing about this airplane is that uh, it has on the top of it, and you can see one, there are four of them, and right up there, you see that it's, it's a lifting ring. The four of them on the top of the airplane, that means this airplane came from Cessna uh, with a seaplane kit. And that is you can take a uh, a crane, you can lift the airplane up, you take the wheels off and put floats on. And then it also has zinc chromated interior, stainless steel cables. It has a beefing section up in the front of it for stressing and so forth. Um, so that kind of covers, I guess, 50 gallons autopilot. Um, I hold the window up with uh, one of the new super magnets. I don't think this picture has the super magnets on it, but you can see right up here the window is open. And uh, that's how I fly when I'm using the camera. As I say, it uh, doesn't make any sense to spend $5,000 for a lens and then shoot out uh, ple scratched plexiglass. So that, that's why that goes up there. Okay, um, I do fly the airplane. I run the camera at the same time. That Seems to amaze a few people, but you know you get used to it after a while. Fly with my left hand, run the camera with my right hand. And uh, this, I didn't bring along the hand grip for this camera. Again, we'll talk about this a little later. This is a Bronica GS1. 
and it's a film camera, and it has a right hand grip, which is essential for me uh, because when I fly with the left and run the camera with my right. Uh, underneath the camera, I uh, will talk again about this a little bit later, uh, there's a gyroscopic stabilizer that I put underneath it. That whole affair weighs just a little less than 14 pounds. So beside my lazy boy chair at home and in front of the TV, I've got a little dumbbell I work with every now and then to keep all that up. It amazes some people that I do fly with my left hand, run with my right hand. I sometimes say it's, a, it's very much akin to a one-man band, you know. He sits there and he's beating on the drum and he's playing on the keys and playing a harmonica and so forth. And, uh, but somebody once said, well, but he's sitting on a piano stool. <laughs> so that's the difference there. Okay, camera equipment, let's go to that. Um, this I said is the Bronica GS1 right hand grip. And the Bronica comes apart uh, all over the place. Um, this is, uh, I haven't, I've transitioned to digital photography. So if I look like I'm a little stupid in trying to take this thing apart here, this is the, uh, the lens. This is a 200 millimeter lens, which I like very much because the standard focal length on the GS1 is 100 millimeter. And it's referred to as a medium format camera. And the image size is 6 by 7 centimeters, or 2 and a quarter by 2 and 3 quarter. And I always like to show the front end of this. That's a rather impressive piece of glass. It's been so long now uh, since I bought this. I don't know what it did cost, but it was uh, pretty expensive. I actually have, uh, I think, five lenses that I use. And I have uh, four film backs. And uh, this is the uh, film back. Geez, how do I get this thing off of here? <laughs> I haven't used this in a while. There it is right here. OK. This is the size of the image. And that's called a dark slide. The dark slide goes in and out, and you can take the backs off. I have four backs so that um, when I'd be traveling between locations, I could change film and have film ready to go in a new film back. It also has a, a different variation of viewfinders. And again, I don't want to try to take this off from here, but uh, this is, again, a component that comes off. At one time, uh, I had a situation where this didn't seem to lock on very tightly and would work OK. Uh, but I was up around the South Fox Island taking pictures once. It happened to be a very turbulent day. And I was starting to use uh, digital cameras. And I'd shot stuff with digital, and I switched cameras, picked up this one. And I guess I said it was over South Fox Island where I was. And I hit some turbulence, and my head hit the front of this. And this viewfinder on the top came off. I tried to catch it with my arm, went out the window. And I'm looking down, it's going like this, you know, down into. So if anybody's up, up diving off of South Fox Island, keep your eyes open for this viewfinder. Right? <laughs> Um, rather impressive. We'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about uh, film. That's a film camera. Of course, today everything is digital. This right here, I would get ten, 10 images on. 10 images. This is the film right here. My favorite film back then was Kodak Kodachrome. Excellent film, long lasting. Uh, do we have any professional photographers in the crowd? Hey, okay, there's one. <laughs> Somebody admitted <laughs> what is going on here. Um, and of course, today, you know, 10 images on this. And then here is a. Um, Sixty-four gigabyte card which holds, I think, 256 or 300 images on this card. And I really have switched over to digital everything, I must admit, grudgingly, I guess. Kodachrome film, you know, is, uh, was developed by Kodak, and it actually is uh, three layers of black and white film separated by filters, 
RGB filter, and the light that goes down each records on a different layer. And this is a called a 120 roll of film, and also they make 220 film, but Kodak never produced Kodachrome in 220. And the explanation I heard was that because of this thickness of the film, it would not fit in roll film cameras and be able to roll forward. So that's one of the reasons for that. Um, cameras, let's see here, we're talking about, um, this is the gyroscopic stabilizer. This is that thing that goes together and weighs 19 pounds. Runs at uh, 22,000 RPM. And it's just like stabilizers in airplanes and all other submarines and so forth. It tends to keep things steady when you're shooting. And um, I occasionally will do presentations to kids in school, particularly the fourth grade a few years ago when March of the year was Michigan month, I think they referred to it as. And um, I was doing one, and I forget where the school was, Ovid, somewhere around nearby Lansing. And I um, was talking about the stabilizer and the camera, the Bronica camera and so forth, telling them it weighed just a little bit less than 14 pounds. I said, hey, who's the, who's the strongest guy in class? The boy, just like that, boom, he picked up in the back end. He says, I am. I said, come on up here and grab a hold of this. Tell me what you think of it. He picks that thing up, you know, and yeah, not too bad, he says, and so forth. Well, um, my, my, my friend, his daughter was the teacher of the school, and afterwards she said, I was stunned. This kid was the most irresponsible kid in school. And I'm <laughs> turning him over to five, ten thousand dollars with the camera equipment or something, you know, so. Okay. Um, I um, had an interesting quip once. I was doing once a book signing or a, a presentation at Neiman Marcus. And um, this lady came over. I don't know what she remember what she did. And she says, well, are you a professional? And I said, well, I don't know. I guess I am. I've done everything wrong that can be done wrong. And I think that's, <laughs> what, that's what makes a professional. Uh, digital, let's talk a little bit about digital cameras. This is a Nikon, uh, not a Nikon. I started out with a Nikon 5700. First digital camera, it was not very good. I abandoned it quickly. This, I've been through two or three uh, iterations of the Canon camera. I do like it. This is the EOS 7D Mark IIA or something. I even forget what it is. It's a zoom lens. It's uh, 24 to 105. And of course, when the early zoom lenses came out, they were not very reliable or stable, um, it's an autofocus and so forth. Um, and this has uh, yeah, an autofocus and it has a stabilizer, an electronic stabilizer that's built in the inside of it. And uh, I really use this now all the time. This is a, it's an excellent camera, excellent camera. I suppose as I go through here, I might take one or two minutes if anybody has any quick questions. Otherwise, we'd wait at the tail end. Yes, ma'am. I have to click, yes. <laughs> Actually, I didn't bring it. I, I think I still have one. Uh, the Bronica camera had what's called a rapid film advance, and it's a thumb thing. It had two strokes with it, and it would take it forward to the next row. Interesting sidelight on the camera. I finally wound up with about three Bronicas uh, amongst everything else, and back uh, six months to a year ago, I had a message uh, email, I guess it was, from a physician uh, in Montreal, and he said, I was looking at your website, and I want to kind of fool around with black and white photography on film. And so we talked a little bit, and he wound up buying my old Bronica camera for a fairly decent price, so that was pretty good. Okay, any other questions on camera stuff? Yes, sir. Not on camera, but aren't you going to talk about lighthouses? <laughs> lighthouses? I don't know about lighthouses. <laughs> I'll tell you how I get there. Six hours, remember. You gotta, if you want to get rid of me, fake sleeping. Okay, here we go. Photographic prints. Hey, that's right. Next. Um, 
digital, we talked about that, exhibit prints, uh, composition, um, okay, let's, um, what did I do with it here? I thought I had it somewhere. Where's my little, here it is right here. Um, I started on the Lighthouse series in about 19, late 1985, early 86. Took me six and a half years to put everything together. That was all the flying, all the photography, and the book. And uh, I published the book myself. If you want to learn something in life, publish a book. There are a few bandits in the printing industry. Um, the first printer shorted me 1,700 copies. And uh, technic kind of a technical problem. This book was the first book printed. Any printers in the audience? That's good, too. <laughs> Uh, this was the first book printed in the United States in 400 line screen on a waterless press, which gives it very fine resolution. But it's very critical in terms of temperature, plus or minus a half a degree. So that as they were still experimenting with it on me, my money. And you know, when you uh, print the book yourself, we interviewed five different printers, two different binderies. Uh, bought the paper directly from the mill and had it shipped to St. Louis for the first printing. The second printing uh, was done by uh, Color, uh, not, first printing was Color Associates. Uh, the second printing was done by, in Kalamazoo, uh, Superior Color, and then their sister company, Etheridge in Grand Rapids. Each did such a big project, each one of them did seven forms. Um, the book, 175 color photos, 168 pages. Yes, ma'am. Where did you take that picture? She's going to she's going to get me into lighthouses, isn't she? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I told you. My daughter and I traveled around the UK and around Michigan, Michigan Lake, and we were trying to find lighthouses, and they're very hard to find on land. You need a copy of my <laughs> That, I'd like to know where that goes. Okay, here you go. Thanks. That's Spectacle Reef. Do you know where that is? Anybody know where Spectacle Reef is? No. It is a long ways out in Upper Lake Huron, probably 25 miles northeast of uh, Sheboygan. Sheboygan. And uh, Spectacle Reef is kind of an interesting structure. It is built out of uh, stone. I'm not sure whether it's limestone. It was cut. The stone was cut in Marblehead, Ohio, um, and the, all the individual pieces around the outside of it, I've been there on the surface of it, and there's a ridge around each stone like this that's all been engraved into it. Beautiful, beautiful work. The stones were assembled down at Marblehead. They were numbered and then transported up into Upper Lake Huron and then assembled on the... Um, the uh, <coughs> No, oh, casing, whatever you want to call it there. Um, took four and a half years to do that, to build wow. Spectacle Reef. Spectacle Reef has a second order Fresnel lens. F-R-E-S-N-E-L, pronounced Fresnel. And there are four, five in Great Lakes, four second order lenses are in Michigan waters. Um, White Shoal, front cover of the Book, hey, that's right, you got it. White Shoal. Um, Rock of Ages, Spectacle Reef. Um, what's the fourth one? The uh, fifth one is Split Rock up in Minnesota. Up Minnesota. Um, I'll think about it in a few minutes. I just turned 82 on the 4th of July, so when I have a little brain mess here, you can excuse me, I hope. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about composition. Okay, a lot of my pictures are taken in spring of the year or in the winter, and that's because I like all of the various formations of ice that you see around the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an example here on the side of what's called reefing ice. Uh, reefing ice is the result of, of wave action. It builds up in sheets, and then it piles it up, and you can see the piles over here. Um, Another thing I liked particularly on this shot was the ice forming around it. 
But secondly, I wanted to get the windows on this part in the shot. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, I wanted to get the, uh, the divot that's over here on the side. This is called the engine room. And then, of course, the lantern room is up here at the top. And um, the shadow also off to the side at maybe a 45 degree angle, that's the shadow. And then I like to approach something like this as a, a square structure um, from sort of an angle, shooting at it this way rather than straight across like this. It, it offers a much better perspective to it. When I'm setting up to take a picture like this, I may make six or eight passes at least to get a shot like this. And various things can interfere. You know, you've got wind drift. You've got to adjust for that. Uh, I may have a strut on the airplane that kind of gets in the way because of positioning of it. Uh, you may have turbulence when you're going around. So the airplane the camera is getting bounced around. So, you know, it, it may take several passes uh, around like that. Yes, ma'am. Well, don't ask me about active. I don't know. That changes all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I would say that <clears throat> it has become sort of a fashionable thing for the state of Michigan to talk about how many we have. We do have more than any other state in the union. How many? Yeah. Well, we're going how many? well, I don't know. The state says something like 126. Um, the uh, Penrose wrote a book. It says the guide to 116 Michigan lighthouses. Maybe some of you have that. Anybody have that book here? How many here have my book? <laughs> oh, oh, what an opportunity. <laughs> um, I, I define in the first chapter what I have collected in there, and I, I generally say it's a, a lighthouse that has been attended or manned. And uh, we'll maybe talk a little more about that as we go along. Um, I number 104 in my book. But then there are a number of exceptions. There are range lights, like Presque Isle, front and rear range. I show it in the book, but I don't give them numbers. Mm -hmm. um, another one is Copper Harbor range lights, front and rear. But again, I show it in the book, but I don't number it. There are other pictures that are in the book that may be just one photo, like St. Joe, where it has an inner and outer pier light. One photo, one number. But Coast Guard counts that as two aids to navigation. And that's kind of the key to it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually have a deal going, and that is if somebody can name a lighthouse that's not in my book, they get the book free. <laughs> yes, but if it is, they have to buy a copy. So it's, <laughs> um, talking about reefing ice, I don't know that any of you may have to stand up or something to see certain things, but let's just talk briefly here about this uh, poster as it really is. I produced this for uh, the centennial of the Round Island Lighthouse. And do, do, do you remember the stamps that were produced by the U.S. Postal Service commemorating one stamp for each of the five Great Lakes? Yeah. Over here is a, a poster that I produced. I knew which lights had been selected earlier, and I took photographs of all of them. And then uh, these are the Postal Service <laughs> stamps that were produced. Um, they are canceled from the Sheboygan, Michigan post office on the first day of issue. Stamp collectors, any stamp collectors around somewhere? Okay. First day of issue then, that means that's the only place in the country where those stamps are available. Canceled at the, at the Sheboygan, Michigan post office. And then here I have the little booklet cover that, uh, that the stamps came in. And then these are the five lighthouses on the Great Lakes. And that is Split Rock up in Minnesota, that's Spectacle Reef up in Lake Huron. This is 30 Mile Point in Ontario. And this is St. Joe um, on Lake Michigan. And then Marblehead uh, representing Lake Erie. I don't know if she's strong enough or not. Well, she took it down. Oh, did she? Wow. Okay, one on each end. Watch the top up there, girls. Okay, there you go. Sure is, sure is good to have good help, isn't it?
Um, by the way, I'm delivering that to a customer this afternoon when I leave here. Mm. But I, but I probably could produce another one if somebody oh, wanted. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I thought there was nobody here from the FAA. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, all I can say is where I go and what I do is, <laughs> is <laughs> you know, in fact, I, I've almost thought that, that the um, photography that I've done through the years might not be possible today with all of the, um, yeah. you know, security things we have going around. Yeah. Um, some people kind of ask, what altitude do you fly at? He said, oh, whatever is necessary. Mm -hmm. I remember once I was going down the Detroit River and a helicopter went by above me. So um, that's an oh, idea what it is. Yeah. Ooh. Uh -huh. um, it's a little low. Did I see, it? <laughs> did I see another hand somewhere? OK, that's good. We caught up. Anyhow, yes, that's the poster stamp uh, that uh, we did for commemorating the um, stamps of the Great Lakes. Um, next, what do we want to do here? I guess I can hold this one up and show it. I was really low when I took this one. <laughs> this is the Gaines Depot, which is about 20 miles southwest of Flint. Anybody know where Gaines is? Yeah. Oh, geez, that's it, okay. This is kind of an interesting picture. You notice on the barn, there's a spray painting on the thing. It, uh, it says Judas Priest. I thought that was a sacrilegious uh, type of comment or <laughs> adverse. You know, I learned it's a, it's a rock singing group, a rock group. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little slow. I only learned that a year or two ago. <laughs> Anyhow, that's Gaines Depot. Kind of a neat picture. Foggy day. Um, other picture, I guess, as long as I'm over here, we can talk about this. This is the uh, Mackinac Bridge, of course. Very unusual photograph in that uh, the shadow of the bridge, I got to see here if I keep track of what I'm talking about. Uh, the shadow of the bridge um, falls within the picture, and that slash through the center is where the icebreaker Mackinac, it's called the ice track. And of course, it disappears behind the bridge and the spires, but then it's obvious in the shadow. It's obvious in the shadow. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you something else about this, too. Let me go back and grab a couple other things. We're going to talk about, going back a little bit, talking about digital. I hope to deliver this this afternoon. The wood floors, these do not have buttons on the bottom that stop it from slipping. Um, the Mackinac Bridge photo. Color photograph that was made from a negative back uh, many years ago. And uh, as the people who know in photography, um, color printing back then was pretty difficult to do. You had shelf life of chemicals of 28, 30 days. It was very difficult to do. So I shipped all of my color stuff out to a lab down in Michigan City, Customation, I think it was. And uh, on one occasion, that picture was down there, and um, it uh, it befell. Well, you've seen, you saw that picture up there, whatever it is. It uh, what's the word I want? Befell, maybe, or something. Adversity. It got blown off, dropped off on the floor, and it appears that somebody stepped on it. There was a crease here, something up here, and up here. It was in very bad shape. Obviously, they were very, you know, concerned about it. Did their very best to produce other images. This was something that they did to touch up and so forth. And this is an example of a print that kind of came out during some of the testing. Some little bit of uh, work down here, a little more work up here. And of course, I'd sold a number of these through the years. And I was rather, what, chagrined, devastated, or whatever, by it. Advent of digital photography. Took the original negative, scanned it, and were able to touch up all of those, those pieces that were damaged. And 
neat thing to do, neat thing to do. And of course, that print over there now is the result of having been retouched. Um, that print also is on canvas. I have a, a Hewlett Packard uh, Z3100 uh, printer, which is 44 inches wide width. And I can print something 100 feet long if you want it that long on canvas. So it prints also on paper, and it prints on canvas. That's on canvas. That's on canvas. Uh, the Gaines Depot is on paper. And that, that poor old shot of me up there, that's been around for about 40 years. It's been blown over, rained upon, probably spat upon by my competitors. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just like to keep showing it, say it's a tough world out there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I do have. Or okay. right now, could you like start <coughs> Michigan, right? Uh, start and go around like the. Two answers. Can you name some of those all the way around the state that we could drive to? You know, I, I, I've been to a few, but I was wondering. Another one needs a copy of my book, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can hey. Oh, yes. Yeah, there are several maps that are available. Now, in my book, I, it's four sections. It starts out Lake Superior. The first part of the section, um, I show a map of Lake Superior and then the numbering of all the lighthouses around. In the back in the index, it shows the number of the light and then the page number that it would be on. Second section is Lake Michigan. The third is the Straits. And the fourth section is Lake Huron and Southeast. So in answer to your question. I do have, I do have a big map that goes along with the exhibits. Uh, I have what's called a traveling exhibit. And we're in the process of kind of cleaning things up on that and packaging it and so forth. Next Monday, the ladies from the St. Joseph Historical Society, I guess it is, is coming up and is going to take the entire 120-piece traveling exhibit down, and it will be exhibited from April 1st of next year through the end of the year, December 31st. And in that collection, I do have a very large piece that is numbered with numbered tacks, and then it shows the corresponding uh, lighthouses that are each of those places. So that, that is an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Where it will be exhibited? St. Joe, Michigan. St. Joseph. In St. Joe. In Saint Joe Saint at Joe. the St. Joe yeah. Memorial Museum, or whatever it's called. You know, I had an exhibit here back 15 years ago. Uh, Lorraine and I were talking about that. Um, uh, here. Yes, ma'am. You said that you liked the composition of the, um, the show. Of, of uh, Spectacle Reef? Spectacle yes, Reef. yes. yes. Well, I guess it happens. I, um, I, I've made, uh, you know, over a period of six and a half years, uh, that time frame, I flew, I think, about 750 hours. Mm -hmm. And not all of it was just doing lighthouse photography, but a good portion of it. And planning ahead, um, the one thing I would do in planning ahead is that here again in the book, da -dum -da -dum, um, I show a picture of, of um, right here. Boy, how did I get to that so quickly? Doot, 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 doot. Picture on the left-hand side, that is the petroleum ship Interchem Catalyst. And you can see in the far upper right is the icebreaker Mackinac in white. They since painted it to, uh, to uh, red. I, I sometimes say after looking at this picture. But, I show here the text on the left-hand side in answer to your question. I'll read maybe a little bit of it. Coast Guard Ice Reports. This came from the Great Lakes Ice Outlook from the National Weather Service in Cleveland on March the 7th, 1991. Coast Guard Ice Reports since yesterday noted that coverage in the Straits was down to 90% from White Shoal five miles west of the bridge to a pool of open water extended for another mile towards the bridge 
Ice covered six to eight inches in Mackinac track, but 16 to 20 inches north of the track. Coast Guard indicated track was holding well. Ice was easily penetrable in the trap by high-powered ships and should be able to navigate ice areas in the southern lakes without difficulty in the northern lakes. Freezing degree days have not reached peak yet. Da -da -da, a few other things. I would pick that up from the Weather Bureau in Lansing, so I had an indication as to what the ice conditions were out in the lakes and what ships were moving through it and where the ice breakers and so forth would be working. Yes, sir? Yes, yes. That's why many of them are being excessed today. Um, you periodically see where, uh, in fact, uh, Spectacle Reef up there was show, sold about uh, two years ago, maybe, to a young fellow from Massachusetts. Um, an enormous amount of work. The inside of these places just look terrible. Um, birds get into them and so forth. In fact, um, I'll tell you a little story here. Let's go back to one other thing here in the book. This is the Port Austin Reef Lighthouse. Uh, on the, my left-hand side is the lighthouse prior to restoration. They established a group there. I mentioned my friend Lou Schillinger. He heads it up. Um, called the Port Austin Reef P Restoration something, P-A-R-L-A. Um, that's a picture before. This is a picture that was taken after the exterior was done. And then this was a picture that I took of the whole restoration group out on the ladder at uh, Port Austin Reef. And um, I have a little article here that I wrote. I got a great kick out of doing it. It's entitled, Burning the Tennies. One uh, afternoon or day or evening, I was over at, the, um, at the Port Austin we all got together that night for a burger and beer at Bill and Harry's bar. And uh, I sort of elicited everybody to start relating tales of, uh, of uh, the restoration work that they were doing. And of course, one of the major issues was that you can see this is all open. The birds and the seagulls and the pigeon pigeons were just filled this place. And the stairway was piled a foot high with bird, bird dung, bird dung. Did I say that nicely enough? <laughs> so anyhow, they were out there and it took them a year or something like that with shovels and they were shoveling all this stuff out, getting it cleaned out. And then the next big job was to keep the birds out. They had to put all the windows back in and secure everything. They finally got that done. And on the day that that was done, they were sort of celebrating. I don't know whether they're into the hooch or not, but uh, they built a little bonfire of all the scrap lumber that was laying around. And when they were working out there, they'd go back. They didn't dare take their shoes with them. So they were, shoes were piled up outside the lighthouse. And um, as the fire got going, somebody decided they started throwing their shoes <laughs> into the fire. So that's, I relate that in the little article here, burning the tennies under the Port Austin lighthouse. <laughs> A lot of fun. OK. Um, in fact, actually, this is a limited edition that we did for, of the book uh, for the Port Austin Lighthouse Centennial. And again, like you know, we did with some other things, uh, this is the Port Austin Lighthouse. These are the stamps canceled at the Port Austin Post Office, right there. And I might add that in, when I designed this book, this is page nine, the title page, I designed that page to personalized autographs mm. in the book. Mm. OK, let's see, is there anything I forget here? Um, I elected to, I elected to do this. Yes, question. Yes. Have you been inside all the lighthouses that you have photographed? Nope. No? Nope. Not very many of them. Yeah, they look a lot better. <laughs> every, every now and then someone will ask me, they'll show me a picture and say, which lighthouse is this? I say, I don't know, it's, it's on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> have you taken just aerial photographs of the lighthouses or have you been actually on the ground? Well, I've been on the ground at quite a few of them and I've taken pictures there, but you know, my forte is driving airplanes and running a camera, so it's kind of it. Um, 
I lost my train of thought here. Let me go back to my cheat sheet here again. Yes, other question? Question? Favorite? White Shoal. White Shoal right on the front cover. And of course, in the book, I do show also the second order Fresnel lens that, is, that was removed from the White Shoal Lighthouse. And um, that is on display at the Whitefish Historical Museum up at uh, Whitefish Point. And this is a shot of the second order Fresnel lens right here. That's about eight feet in diameter. And then on the left-hand page is the um, winding mechanism that rotates it. Okay, um, let me talk a little bit about White Shoal. Anybody here have a license plate with the lighthouse on it? Oh, two. Two, okay. Do you know that that's my image that's on the plate? I, I donated that to the Secretary of State's office. They've raised to date two and a half million dollars for the restoration and maintenance of lighthouses. My children thought I should have had a 7% override, but uh, I wasn't smart enough to do that. And about six to eight months ago, uh, they changed the image to something that is, has nothing to do with Michigan. It was terrible. I think it's a terrible mistake. Uh, you know, that's government at work, I guess. Yeah. Anybody seen the new plate? It just is a. It just is something kind of like this, with a little thing on the top yeah. of it. It just okay. looks like nothing. So anyhow, okay. no, this is this is actually my license right there. My license. Well, it, it just doesn't look anything. It, it, look, it, it does not represent any lighthouse no. in Michigan. None in Michigan whatsoever. Okay. Um, let's drag it. Let's see here. Anything else? Uh, any other questions while I'm trying to think of what else to say? Does anybody live in any of those lighthouses? Like, they're permanent residents. There's only a few. Very few. There are a few, yeah. I'm trying to think of which ones might be. There are several, you know, that do invite people in to spend a week or two. They're yeah. trained as docents. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Sabo Lighthouses. The Sabo Group operates four lighthouses. Big Sabo, Little Sabo, White River, and Ludington. Those are the four that they maintain. And they invite people in for one week and two weeks and so forth, and they stay there. Another one that has keepers is the Detour Reef. Uh, Detour Reef has been a big project in restoration. And it really looks, uh, really looks uh, very, very good. I've not been on Detour Reef in person, so. Okay, any other questions? Way back there. Yes. Yes. Very funny. Yeah. Take a grandchild with you. Get about it. Okay, other question. Yes, ma'am. Do you have the book and are you selling it today? Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I always, I, I'll tell you another little side story on that, I guess, too. I personalize autographs. Uh, my expression is to Uncle Harry, my favorite uncle, don't forget me in your will. <laughs> so, and I sort of got that back when I was in the diving business, about 1956 or so, I had occasion, I had occasion to um, be an evening, spend an evening with Jacques Cousteau and his wife Simone and Jim Dugan, who was his publicist at the time, had dinner and was on TV that evening. And I had a copy of The Silent World which both Jacques, Jim Dumont, and his wife Simone autographed for me. It was something to the effect, to the plungers, it was all in French, 
to the plungers, the divers of the Great Lakes, from the divers of the Mediterranean, and that kind of thing. And I've always sort of used that as a, what, a, a, a benchmark or whatever that I would personalize autographs for other people in my book. And I mentioned the title page, page nine. As I say, I designed the book uh, to, uh, to autograph on that page. And let me, I'll make one other little pitch for it, okay? You asked for it. And that is, how, how many occasions we may go out to dinner to celebrate some kind of an event, a birthday, an anniversary, a holiday, or something such as that. And um, I defy three weeks later for anybody to remember where they went, number two, what they had to eat, or thirdly, who picked up the bill. <laughs> And you can sure spend $100 today going out for dinner with a couple of different people. And I say that with a personalized book such as this, anytime they open it, they will think from where it came. How about that? That's my pitch for the day. OK, one other little thing here. Let me just um, wrap up here with a little, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, fashionable for an author to read from his book. And I will. Page 44. When I began this photographic series, lighthouses along the shoreline were most logical and convenient to photograph. As time passed, I continued to expand the collection, and flight to the offshore lights was inevitable. Later, the decision to photograph all the lights, especially when I considered publishing a book, left no alternative. At that juncture, I decided not to contemplate the consequences of a mechanical malfunction. In 8,000 hours of flying, I have never experienced total engine failure in a single engine airplane, although in a twin engine aircraft, I've lost one engine, had one engine fail, and one precautionary shutdown due to an oil leak. The consequences of such an event over Lake Superior or Michigan are obvious. I have never considered the use of flotation or survival equipment. Why linger in Lake Superior in March? <laughs> there you are. Ah. I made it. 45 minutes. Look at that. Uh, the book. I just reduced the price a couple of months ago. I've sold 15,000 copies at $75, and I reduced the price to 59 what a bargain. What a bargain. And the autograph is free or... I would guess that uh, Standard Rock in Lake Superior is probably 25 miles out. And Standard Rock, uh, standard, you know, I could tell you a story probably about every other picture in the book. Standard Rock is up front. Here's one shot of it right here. Standard Rock. OK. The world's record lake trout was taken just within a quarter of a mile, where it drops down to about 700 feet off of this. Um, this picture, I was out taking some low-level <laughs> shots of Standard Rock, somewhere over here. Here's, uh, here's Standard Rock right here. OK. and. Um, This picture I took as I was climbing out after having taken the lower shots. And I looked back at the lighthouse, and it was kind of running through my mind that uh, if this engine quit, could I ever swim back to the lighthouse? And I'm looking down, I was having a rather abrupt climb out. And I swam in high school and I swam in college. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow. I wound up taking a, I laid my cameras down. I wound up picking up the cameras and reshooting it. And it was a picture I wound up using in the book. So that's probably the furthest out. So. Okay, friends, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Nice crowd. I'm not, I'm not sure I ever made a presentation to a sellout crowd, so I appreciate it.